Hi friends, here's the question. What is the sin of the angels? Did the angels actually commit a sin? The answer is yes, and what is the sin of the angels I'm gonna come back to, but I'm gonna kind of lay the groundwork because the sin of the angels, what they did is something that we can do too. What they were susceptible to is something that you and I can be susceptible to. What caused their fall can also cause our fall and has caused the fall of some of our loved ones. So um, the background, uh, let's look at the Eucharist, I think, because that's a key pivotal player here. Mark 8. Mark 8, Jesus has just multipl multiplied the loaves, right? Fed thousands. And he sends some of his disciples on the boat to the other shore. And he's like, you know, and I listen, um, you know, here, here, here's what we're going to do. And, and Mark, he records this little detail that doesn't, that seems strange, right? And that is that they only had one loaf of bread with them in, in the boat. But then the disciples say that they had forgotten the bread. So which is it? Did they forget the bread or did they have one loaf of bread? And really what all this has to do with is the multiplication of loaves. God had created hundreds and hundreds of loaves and they had loaves left over. How is it that the disciples forgot to bring enough provision with them in the boat? So that's kind of odd for us, right? But Mark does record that there is one loaf. So what does all this mean? Well, it, it means what we suspect it means, right? Because I started talking about the Eucharist. The one loaf is the, the miraculous bread. It's Jesus Christ. Mark is recording, trying to help us to see, okay, so Jesus has the power to take you know, a few loaves and multiply them and, 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 and feed thousands upon thousands of people, right? And now there's only one loaf. It's actually Jesus. And, 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 and this greater miraculous loaf, the, the, the greater bread, the, the, the best bread, it's the bread that's not just multiplied, but is changed from bread into him, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And he's not only going to be able to feed um, thousands, he's going to feed millions, he's going to feed billions, he's going to feed all across time. He is that bread of life. So that's kind of some of the background here uh, and, and, and what uh, you know, uh, Mark is recording. Because here, here's the thing. They're journeying to the other side. And so are we. We're journeying from one side of life to the other side. And we're in a boat together. And what Mark is recording, what Jesus is trying to teach us, is that he's in the boat with us. And the only provision ultimately that we really need, the only thing that's going to sustain us for this long journey from one shore to the next, is the miraculous bread, is the bread of life. And what God is saying to us, what Christ is saying to us, is that I will be with you in that boat. I'll be with you on this journey. You'll always have access to me. This is his reason for um, remaining with us in the Eucharist, is to feed us for the journey through this life on earth, and into the life of heaven. Okay. So keep that in mind. Because in another place, Luke, the gospel writer, records in Luke uh, 10, 18. He says this. I, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like the lightning from heaven. I saw Satan fall like the lightning from heaven. Now there are other places where we hear about Satan, Lucifer, falling from heaven and, and, and one third of the angels falling. For, for instance, like at the beginning, you know, in Genesis and also at the end, uh, just to name a few, uh, in the book of Revelation. But what we know is that the angels were created before humanity. They were created in the presence of God. They were created pure and without sin. They um, are... Uh, only spirit, not body and spirit. And they are um, super spiritual, meaning they have an uh, intellectual um, power that far exceeds humanity. They are not eternal in that they've always been with God who is eternal. But at some point in eternity, God 
created the angels. And they are greater beings than us in many ways. But here's the thing. God anticipated the fall. Of course he did, because he stands before all time and space. So he knew that you and I were going to fall. And many theologians, a lot smarter than me, um, many great saints, a lot holier than me, have pondered, what was it that caused the angels to fall? And how could that be possible? Right? Because they're in the presence of God. And once in the presence of God, how can you help but not choose him? Right? At some point, God would give to the angels what he gave to his disciples, what he gave to you and what he gave to me. He would give them freedom. He would give them freedom to be able to either choose him with their freedom, which is the reason why he gives us freedom, or if he's going to give them freedom, and if it's really going to be freedom, then he has to give them the power, the opportunity, the choice to be able to not choose him. And so that's what many great saints and theologians have concluded is that God gave them the power to choose him or not to choose him. Because ultimately he wanted not just humans to love him. He, he doesn't need that, but he's love and, 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 and his, he's creative love. And creative love cre it, you know, creates others and, and, uh, and loves them and, and, is, and receives them in love. And he's perfect love. And he knows that he's the most perfect love that we can ever love. And that this is going to bring us happiness, and that's what he wants. So, you know, that's why he gives us the freedom. But he wants this for the angels also. Well, okay, that's that only answers one part. But the second part is important, too. And that is, how could it be that the angels would not choose God? Okay, so they're given freedom to choose him or not to choose him. But what would it take for them not to choose God. Like, what does that look like? What, what would be so radical to them that they were like, mm, we're out of here. You know, we're no longer going to choose you, God. We're going to choose our own plan and we're not going to stay with you in heaven. Well, and create hell because that's how hell was created. God didn't create it. It was the fall of Lucifer and one third of the angels who chose not to bend the knee and to love, know uh, God's plan and serve him and, and, uh, for all of eternity. So when they left heaven, they, they're the ones who created hell, but not just for themselves, for anyone else who has the freedom and chooses to follow their own plan rather than God's plan. So what was that? Okay, well, in all honesty, we don't know, right? Because the scriptures don't reveal this directly to us. But when we connect all the dots, I think it goes back to the disciples in the boat on a journey through from one shore to the next. And you and I in that same boat of life on the journey from the shore of life to the shores of heaven and um, having the freedom to be able to choose him. This is what I'm getting at. God made known to Lucifer and to all the angels that um, he was going to become human. First of all, that he was going to create humanity, right? And he must have let him know, know enough that he was going to let him know, too, that at some point humanity was going to fall. In fact, from the very beginning. And that they would sin. And that they would choose not to serve God. Some of them. But also uh, let him know who hu humans were, you know, that... Um, they, they didn't have the super intellect that we had, um, uh, the angels have. And uh, they don't possess some of the other abilities and properties that angels have, let alone the fact that they were going to sin, that they weren't going to be pure, right? And when God made known this to the angels, maybe for them that was too much. But let's just take it another step further, right? God could have made known to them, maybe not the whole plan, right? Uh, from beginning to end, all the way to the end of the ages, the end of time, the recreation of heaven and earth. 
but he made known to them enough to really let them understand what their freedom meant. And he let him know that not only was he going to create humans, but he was going to become a human. And not only was he going to become a human, but then he was going to remain with humanity as bread. Bread that's changed, that's made into his body, blood, soul, and divinity that still looks like bread, tastes like bread, smells like bread. Feels like bread, but it is him. And they get how that's possible, right? Because they understand intellectually so much. They get that where sometimes we don't get that. They get that part. But maybe what they can't get is that he's going to ask them to worship him in human form. And he's going to ask them to worship him at every Mass where bread is changed into his, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Son of God. And it's one thing to worship God in heaven, right? It's another thing for the angels to worship God in human form alongside of all these other human beings that are lesser than them, and then it is an entirely holy other thing that God would ask them to worship him in his son in the form of bread on the altars of churches throughout the world and throughout the ages. Maybe that was just too much. And they couldn't trust God's plan. God's plan to save humanity, to remain with humanity, and how he would feed humanity on their journey across finite time and uh, finite humanity and from this world to the next. Maybe that was just too much for them. And so they had freedom and now they had cause. They had to make a choice like you and I have to make a choice throughout our lives. Will we bend the knee among other sinners and worship God in what appears to be bread? And will we trust God has a plan for our salvation, a very specific plan, or will we choose another plan? Because isn't that, my friends, exactly what um, is presented to us at, at different occasions in our lives? And isn't that exactly what was presented to Adam and Eve? Right? Because it's interesting, one of those angels, Lucifer, who we call Satan, when humanity was created, came to our first parents and said to them, you know, um, you can be like God. You've been given freedom. And God says to you, here's the plan, right? And, uh, but the plan says there are some limitations to you, and that limitation to you is that you cannot grasp at something that he does not want you to have. That's the proverbial apple, right? But what is it? It's, um, it's ultimately saying, God has a plan. Please don't come up with your own plan. Just follow my plan, right? And they, 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 they did because Satan, the fallen angel, says to them, you know, listen, if you grasp at that tree, and its fruit of knowledge of good and evil. I mean, if you uh, uh, choose to accept something other than the goodness of God, which we call evil, then um, you're not gonna you're not gonna die. You're gonna be like God, right? Meaning, you're gonna be the one who comes up with the plan rather than the one who follows the plan. He was tempting them into the very thing that caused him and the other third of the angels to fall. And he does it to this day, to you and I. Because listen, we, we have the freedom and we have the option and the availability every Sunday, for instance, to go to a church, which is where heaven meets earth, as close as heaven's going to get to us on this good earth. We get to go to a church and in that church, there are sinners and there are hypocrites. <laughs> I mean, there's an assembly, an 
ecclesia in Greek, an assembly, a, a, a church. That's what church means. But so there was in heaven an assembly, a church. It's called the church triumphant. Here on this earth it's called the church militant, okay? There was a church in heaven, and there is a church in heaven, an assembly of angels before, before humanity. And there were some angels who were saying to themselves, I'm not going to uh, be among lesser beings. I'm not going to worship you, God, among lesser beings, among these sinners. I'm not going to do it, right? And so one third chose to leave, and the other third, the other two thirds chose to stay. Well, we're, we're, we're right there in that same situation. And that we can see that the church is made up of saints. There are many holy people in church. But we also see that there are many unholy people. And some of them are not just the ones who are in the pews. Some of them are the ones who are leading the mass. <laughs> some of them are our bishops. Some of them have been popes in our history who have lived immoral lives. And we look at them and that is our excuse for departure. I will not worship among them. Right? I will not worship you, God, in your plan for salvation to feed them and feed me. I will not trust your plan. I will come up with a plan on my own. And we remove ourselves from the ecclesia, from the assembly, from the church militant. Just like one third of the angels removed themselves from the presence of God. Because they would not worship among lesser than themselves as they considered themselves to be superior. Is that your struggle? Is that the struggle of some of your children, and some of your friends and fellow parishioners who have left the church? They consider themselves so superior that they will not worship among sinners and hypocrites. But isn't that exactly why these, God created the church? It's not for the superior, but for the sinners and the hypocrites. I know that's why I'm in a church, because I am a sinner. And um, there have been times in which I have not fully and faithfully been able to follow God or chose to follow God in, in small ways and routine ways and sometimes in some pretty significant ways, right? Thank God for the church. Thank God for God's plan. Thank God is better than anything I could come up with because what I would ultimately come up with is a departure. And precisely because I'm a sinner, I can't see that I'm a sinner. And I'm no better than anybody else. And I'm in need of a Savior. And I'm in need of the Eucharist. I'm in need of God among us, who's going to feed me in this course of life, in a boat with other people who are just like myself, in the hopes that I could get to heaven, to that church triumphant, with all those angels who stayed and worship God in whatever form he presented himself fully in heaven, incarnate among us as Jesus Christ and remaining with us in what seems to be bread. And so you have that choice. I, I have that choice, but I will always have the consequences of my choices. And so will you. That is our freedom. Use it wisely. Your plan and God's plan. Until next time.